what it should have said is butter, jam, cream, in that order. It'll all become clear. This is football only better. I'm a special one. I'm talking about facts. I tell to them, Billy Dean, Billy Don, when they are sleeping. I'm not a dreamer, I'm a super romantic. This isn't just football. It's football only better. Jake, Kev and Andy, in that order. Actually, there's no favouritism here, but I will have that made into a, a flag. Andy Brassel, Kev Hatchard, and Jake Oscar Thorpe. He who is actually, for the benefits of those not watching on YouTube, which is where you can watch us, or you can watch us on Twitter, or just download the podcast every week. Thank you for doing that. Um, Kev, how did you describe Jake pre-podcast? He has a combination of beard and roll neck that makes him the hottest new coach in Germany's third division. Third division? Yeah, I Not downgraded him. I went, I went Bundesliga 2 and then I thought, no, Dritter Liga, I'll move him down one. <laughs> That'll do for me and, and that in itself is worth a flag. So perhaps next week... I'll roll one out. I'm not doing next week, so that's how I can swerve that one. Shall we talk in, what, the next 40 minutes, 30 minutes, half an hour or so, that's what 30 minutes is, about all things Premier League. We'll, we'll head into Europe as well, find out maybe what we've we've missed over the last week. But we start at the beginning of time, because that is what happens when Jose Mourinho walks into a football club, isn't it? Time is reset. Life begins again. And Tottenham Hotspur, what are they doing, Andy? What are they doing? Yeah, that's um, it. We can end it there. Uh, yeah. Uh, hopefully something new and exciting for them. If, if one thing makes me feel uh, positive about this, it's the fact that Jose Mourinho has surrounded himself with new coaching brains. I think that's something that's really, really important. So maybe they'll approach with a, a little bit of freshness. The fact that he has brought over Joao Sacramento from Lille, who's a very exciting young coaching star of the future, the idea is, I think, that he wants some tactical input. Mm. And, you know, the, the first start to the first step to changing is realizing that there's something that needs changing. And I think anyone that's watched Mourinho over the last couple of years thinks that he needs to freshen up tactically. He needs some more smarts. And he has been away for 11 months, which I think can be really, really beneficial to a coach. And he's used that time to I think reflect reconsider and of course the, the proof will be when when Tottenham start to play under him but that they might approach things a little bit differently and he realizes that he has had to evolve and you know even coaches like Carlo Ancelotti know that the by the time people are watching or, or listening to this Campos may have already happened another acquisition from Lille their sporting director may have happened and, and he's being seen as being quite key in in how Spurs want to manage money going forward under Mourinho. Yeah, I mean, he and Mourinho are very close. and that What was, would he bring? Well, I, I think knowing how to get young players and seeing them develop into players that are, are worth money. I mean, this has been an issue for Tottenham. If you look where they are, a lot of those players are contractually at the moment. That is a failure really of Daniel Levy over, over the last year and a half or so. Mm -hmm. And since Paul Mitchell's gone, there hasn't been that buffer of football knowledge um, and that eye on development between Levy and Pochettino, which you could argue eventually turned into the death knell for, for their relationship. I think a lot of people can look at Levy versus Mourinho initially and think that it sounds like a, a cheap TV drama or a very expensive t TV <laughs> drama, if you like. And how will that work? Because they're coming from two such different places. I think surrounding Mourinho with new coaching staff, or him surrounding himself with new coaching staff, and then getting that man in the middle who's got that good relationship with Mourinho but knows exactly where Levy's coming from, I think is really important. Well, of course, it will be a TV drama because as we've seen and heard and read over the past <laughs> 24 hours, there's a certain company that have been filming all of this. So we will see how it unfolds. But how is it going to change things markets point of view? You are our European football expert. You are our European football commentator. And you, Kev, sorry, and you, Jake, that sounds like I'm accusing you, uh, Mr. of XGs at Infogol. Does this shift the XGs at all? Does that, that wipe everything that Spurs have done throughout this season? Does it change it? Um, I wouldn't say it wipes it all away, but it, like Andy said, it's a, it's a fresh start for, for Tottenham. And we had the chat uh, beforehand and you rightly pointed out that the squad he's got at Tottenham um, is much better than the one he left at Manchester United. So he's got better players to work with. Um, he's going to have to reinvent himself because towards the end of, uh, of his reign at Manchester United, they were ranked as a mid-table team on expected goals. So he really had to, he's got to, have a, well, he's had 11 months to have a long, hard think about how he can develop as a coach and bring in new ideas. And, you know, Pep Guardiola had a, a sabbatical, took a year out and he came back with innovative ideas. And, um, you know, I, 
I'd be surprised if Pochettino jumped straight into a new job. I think he could probably do one of those. Um, but yeah, I, I think this is a it's, it's going to be interesting. Let's say that um, at the moment Tottenham's process is really poor in defence and really poor in attack. Um, and we all know that Mourinho originally, anyway, is, is a defence first sort of manager. Mm. So I wouldn't be surprised if he jumps straight in and sorts the defence out and they stop conceding chances and stop conceding goals at the rate that they have been. Um, and then it's just about getting his attacking flair players working. He's more than capable of doing that, like you said, with some exciting new coaches around him. It could be, you know, it could be a, a real turn for Tottenham. Really? A whole new Jose Mourinho? We're going to see something a bit different? Possibly. I mean, if you think that... that... <laughs> you don't believe that. No, I don't. <laughs> I, I think if, if you do believe that's the case from a betting perspective, you can back Tottenham on the sports book to finish in the top four at 11-4. to four. Now, they've got a fair bit of ground to make up. Um, but he is still a world-class manager. He's still somebody who has a glittering track record. As Andy says, there may be a change in terms of the people he has around him. But I just want to focus just for a moment on the way that I think Maurizio Pochettino has been treated because I think it's been rather shabby the way it's been done. Uh, I think a guy that gave so much to Spurs and changed the entire culture of that football club, I'm not sure that's been properly recognised. Um, and it feels to me like a strange move when you when you bear in mind that Daniel Levy has been reluctant to spend money in general to then bring in Mourinho on very big wages and to presumably give Mourinho some assurances that players will be brought in and so to spend money in that way. It seems very strange to me that having failed to nail down some key players on long-term contracts, and I, I lay that at Levy's feet, really, having mm -hmm. failed to do that, he then shifts the blame onto Pochettino and brings in Mourinho, hoping that it will paper over some cracks and, and it will get things moving. It may well do. Do I think it's the right thing to have done? No. Sentiment doesn't get you anywhere in football. No, but it? I think it should have earned him the opportunity to put things right. I think... But this this isn't just about the one... and and Right, we've seen this and heard this argument played out over the last few hours, but this isn't just about not winning the Champions League and what's happened mm. since then. It, it, arguably, there was stuff not working out prior to that. Yeah. And if Jose is going to come in, he's going to win something, then why wouldn't you want that? Yeah, um, I do think when we're looking at it from a betting perspective, I think there'll be some people who are out there tempted, not so much Tottenham to make the top four, but what about Tottenham for the Champions League? People will look to win at... win it this season. Yeah, people will, I think, because they're... They're pretty close to being through. If they beat Olympiacos um, in, in the week, they're through. And, and that would be Jose Mourinho's first home game at Tottenham. So you can imagine that new coach bounce, if nothing else, getting them there. And then people will say, ah, oh, but Mourinho is a master of the Champions League. Well, no, he isn't. Not for a long time anyway. He's a previous master of the Champions League. There's no doubt about it. And there's no criticising his career or his history in the competition. The last few times he has been in a knockout game of consequence is being completely outthought and out, by by coaches as well, like Vincenzo Montella, who was having a terrible time at Sevilla at the time. Laurent Blanc, who's not known for his tactical acumen whatsoever. So he needs to rethink if they're going to be dangerous in the Champions League. When, when we were talking about him surrounding himself with new coaches, that is going to be absolutely key to their Champions League hopes. So if you are thinking of will they reach the top four, are they an outside bet for the Champions League? I'd be inclined to go towards the top four bet that Kev outlined. There's some other Jose Mourinho specials <coughs> on betfair.com, not least because it's Jose Mourinho and you can link special into it. This weekend, though, we'll get to those in a minute, Spurs, West Ham. Is that the perfect foil for Jose Mourinho? No, I'm not sure it is. I know West Ham are in poor form. They've taken two points from the last six Premier League games, one win in eight, lost three out of the last six home games in the league. And you look at that and think, well, that maybe justifies Spurs being odds on at 1.82. I'm not sure I see it that way. Spurs have been wretched away from home for quite a long time. They've lost three of their last four away games in the league. They haven't won on the road in the Premier League since January. How much is Mourinho going to have been able to do? Yes, he will have done his big speech, which I'm sure will have resonated with a few players. Tactically, can he change much? Also, it's going to be a bit of a shock to the system. For some of the Pochettino loyalists in that squad... It's going to have hurt mm. to find out that their guy has been removed from the picture and Mourinho has been parachuted in. So, you know, they're in flux. West Ham certainly will get 
raucous support. West Ham fans look forward to these games against Spurs. Um, you know, this is the team they want to beat more than most. And I just think Spurs are too short uh, at 1.82 and I'd be looking to lay that. 12.30 at West Ham then on, on Saturday? I completely agree with what Kev said. I mean, ever since Mourinho was appointed, um, Spurs have, have got shorter in the market, which I think is is just a, a reaction to everyone thinking Mourinho's going to come straight away and solve the problems. I don't think that's going to happen. Like I said, I think he'll sort them out defensively because I, th- I feel like it's an easier thing to do in the short term than develop a, a, an, a, you know, an exploratory attacking uh, force. So I, I agree with Kev. I, I think I think Lane Tottenham, um, I think they're too short for this game. Even West Ham are in, uh, in you know, they're really struggling. They always step the game up for these um, sort of fixtures against Spurs. You think United recently um, as well, obviously against Man City in the opening day, but Man City is just in a different league to Tottenham. I think it's going to be a struggle. I wouldn't be surprised to see a nil-nil draw, um, but I, I, I think Tottenham are too short to win this game. Same. I mean, I agree with these guys. Um, West Ham are not without talent. Um, whether they can put it together consistently, I think is a question that will linger and linger. Can they do it in an individual match? Absolutely. I mean, they're 4.4 on the exchange, 4.3 for the draw. Uh, that's massively overrating Tottenham, especially as Kev was saying with their struggles on the road. Yeah, and if if they do somehow, if Spurs do wallop them this weekend, then Pellegrini's in all sorts of bother as well, mm. isn't he? Yeah, it's a strange one because it looked as though they were clicking at one stage. They've managed to get that balance. But to be fair, Jake's been warning all season long that even though they were winning games, they were giving up lots of chances. You could see that on the XG. And defensively, at times, they've been hopeless. And I think the, the firepower they have has just about covered that. And we're now starting to see maybe where they're at. But one thing I would say positive about Spurs... Harry Kane's got a great record in London derbies in the Premier League. He's got 28 goals in 45 of those games. He's 1.85 to score on the exchange. So if you think if you think there are going to be goals, he's likely to get them and he looked razor sharp for England mm. as well. One of our own. Someone who's not, but could be, Zlatan before the 3rd of February 2020. These are on the Jose Mourinho specials, betfair.com. 13 to 8, that was a few, a few hours ago. Yeah, I think there's been rumours that he's been having chats with AC Milan um, mm. in terms of joining them. He's not coming to sit on the bench, is he? And, and how's he going to get in no. ahead of Harry so Kane? His, his dream job, backing up Harry Kane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, not going to happen. Uh, signed Gareth Bale before the 3rd of February 2020. That was 2-1. to one. Well, Bale does his play for Wales and then play golf, so it's not really the best sign. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I think that would be a, a really sensible move for, for all parties, Real Madrid clearly don't want him there for whatever reasons Zidane doesn't get on with him um, Spurs you know the more quality players you get in the team the better and I'm pretty sure he's a player that Mourinho would love to work with yeah nice, also, nice f- cheap player to bring in in January <laughs> well, to, well to, to, to throw this in the ring uh, every, everyone who's been to the n- new Spurs training ground will know there's an absolutely perfect putting green on the way in <laughs> the rumour is that only Harry Kane's allowed to use it really? They might have to change that yeah. come uh, 3rd of Feb. Well, yeah, Maybe put a few par three holes in there as well. And uh, Matic to come in is my personal favourite <laughs> before the 3rd of Feb. Uh, yeah, I like that. Yeah. I like the idea that Fellaini will go there as well and he'll just kind of get the band back together. Why wouldn't you? Yeah. I, I think, you know, he's a good player, Matic, but he's been on the wane. Yeah. Uh, and I think they've, they're well stocked in that area. I think they'd be fine. What have we got for Wesley Snyder coming out of retirement? Uh, to do what? <laughs> Second Caddy, hole, second staff. hole, yeah, exactly on that. Your favourite, though, involved Manchester United. Yeah, uh, beating Manchester United both home and away. I think that is, um, you know, that, that is the ultimate sort of Mourinho game that he'll be looking forward to and trying to prove a point. And I think it's a little bit short at 9-2 to two for them to win at Old Trafford and then obviously beat them at, at Tottenham. But it comes at a time where I think they've got, I think it's next weekend, actually, or maybe the weekend after. So they've got three or four games for Mourinho to get better in, get to know his players and... It wouldn't be the biggest upset in the world if Spurs went there and got a win. Those are some of the specials then. But just to remind people ahead of Saturday's 12.30 kickoff, where do we think there's value? Run through it quickly. Kev? Uh, I would lay Spurs at 1.82. I think that's definitely the way to go. Mr. Brassel? Copycat, copycat, sitting on the doormat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> would you like a poem? Yeah, I, I don't do poems, unfortunately. Oh, but really? Lane Tottenham also. Yeah, we're all on the bandwagon. Well, I'm not jumping on that particular one. I'm going Spurs uh, 3-0. Harry Kane, hat trick, never going to happen. That is our little run through West Ham Spurs at the weekend. Coming up, we'll talk through the rest of the TV games. 
The West Ham Spurs game then kicks off the telly matches this weekend. Man City Chelsea's 5.30 on Saturday. Sheffield United, Man United, Sunday at 4. I don't know why I went down. Did that need to go down then for Manchester United? I yeah, fancy the chances this week. I've <laughs> done it. I've done it. 4.30. And I was going to go really high for Villa Newcastle, which is Monday night. Very excited. At 8 o'clock. I am excited by that, Jake Osgathorpe. Mm. You were right. I'm more excited, though, about the game of the weekend, arguably. Manchester City, Chelsea. Has there been suitable time that year off that Pep had? The international break that he's had, is that enough to just to resort this City side? I didn't think they were that bad against Liverpool. Um, they actually won the XG battle fairly convincingly. Liverpool were just extremely clinical on the day and I don't think it helped having Claudio Bravo in the net. I think Edison probably would have saved either one or two of those goals. Um, but yeah, I don't think they need to change too much to Man City. Like I said, Edison not playing would be a, would be a big blow. Um, if he's back fit, then I can't see anyone stopping Man City at the minute. And even though Chelsea are playing really well, I've been really impressed with them recently. They come really hot streak, six wins, obviously. The underlying process is fantastic. It's the third best in the league. Uh, but City are just on a different planet when it comes to process. They, they're averaging 3.4 expected goals at home this season, which is about 1.8 more than, or 1.6 more than anyone else in the league at home, which is frightening, really. And I can see them causing an improving Chelsea defence, plenty of problems. And yeah, I think it's going to be a comfortable home win. Um, I'm actually going for Man City on minus one handicap at 2.2. I think that's a really good bet this weekend. I was a backlash. Chelsea are going to face a Man City backlash. I, I'm sure you just said something, but the whole German third division manager image was still right there for me. Was I speaking German? Yes. Uh, Kev, <laughs> Andy, is he right? Uh, I'm going to argue against that. Uh, despite the stylish roll neck, I am going to go against it. I wasn't bewitched by that, right. as you were. Good, good. Uh, I actually think Chelsea can keep this close. Um, away from home, they've won the last six Premier League matches. Uh, they've won uh, their last, sorry, they've won the last six Premier League matches altogether and the last five on the road. And I think if you use the Asian handicap market on the exchange, you can back Chelsea plus one and plus one and a half. Now, what that means is if they lose by one goal, you get a half win. Mm. If they manage to draw or get a win, you get a full win and you can back that at 2.04 on the Asian handicap. City do need a response after that defeat at Anfield. I agree with Jake in the sense that they didn't play that badly. But if you look at some of their home games, the four home wins they've had in the Premier League were all against bottom half sides. They've drawn with Spurs. They've been beaten by Wolves. <laughs> no one draws and with Spurs. I think the way Chelsea have been playing, I think there is a, a, a prospect of them causing a few problems. And I think they can keep it close. Bernardo Silva suspended for City. I think that's a big blow. Yes, they have an incredible squad. Yes, they have a lot of top stars. But I'm not sure they're quite the same team when he's not there. So I, I think Chelsea do have an opportunity to run them close at least. We're going yin to yang as we move up the table. I, th I think Chelsea at, at 74 I mean, they're longer than Southampton are to win at Arsenal, to put that in perspective. And whereas, as Kevin says, Chelsea, I think since the Ajax away game in the Champions League, have gone from promising mm. to we are serious now and showing they can manage games, showing they can close <laughs> out the end of games as well. And I think the XG point about City is a really interesting one, actually, because they've won the XG at Liverpool quite convincingly and yet lost the game quite convincingly. That, that is an issue for me, especially without Bernardo playing, who I think is in an absolutely massive loss in this. I don't think City at the moment, to have a team of that quality that can't necessarily get through a game playing badly and win it, I think that's a bit of an issue, especially against Chelsea. Yeah, I, I get your Bernardo point, but I think Riyad Mahrez has been one of City's most impressive players at the start of the season. He's been benched for the last few weeks because Bernardo's been playing well also. I think Mara's coming back in his, um, you know, he's got a great record against Chelsea. Think of the amount of goals he scored for Leicester when he played against Chelsea. Don't know what it is, whether, it is, whether there's anything in that, but I just think he, he him coming in will be a real bonus. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree. I've been extremely impressed with Chelsea, but they're just not at Man City's level for me. Uh, and I think that they too have had a fairly easy schedule recently. You know, you think that the home games they've played, they play Brighton, play Crystal Palace, who we rate really, really low on uh, unexpected goals. And I think this is going to be a, a statement f uh, game for City. I think last season they won the league by one point. They only lost four games. They've already lost three this season. So they really can't afford to drop any more points if to, to keep up with the, with Liverpool's pace. And yeah, I, I just I, I just feel like this is going to be a real breakout game for City and maybe a 3-1 or a 2-0. There's another interesting angle betting-wise because if you 
you look at the two teams, you look at the attacks, Chelsea have had a few defensive problems. And so you necessarily think, OK, there's going to be a lot of goals in this. Yeah. But actually, if you look at five of the last six meetings in all competitions between them, they've actually featured fewer than three goals. Under two and a half goals in this is 2.98 on the exchange. Under three and a half is 1.84. So if that's the way you want to go, there are some nice prices to to approach. Are we forgetting about the six niller? Yeah, but I think it's a totally different Chelsea. Good. Uh, I think it is a totally different Chelsea. I was just I think... being contrary. No, but it's a good point to make. Yeah. Thank you. Point to make. Well said, done. Thank you very much. <laughs> Can we have a little round of applause yeah. for me? Yeah, well done me. Uh, Sheffield United, oh. Manchester United. Not to <laughs> labour a point about Pochettino, what's this done to Ole Gunnar Solskjaer? Poch becoming available. Anything? Uh, well, no. I wonder if it has. I mean, if I was Ed Woodward, you know, I, I would have been straight on the phone the minute I saw the little yellow ticker come up on the TV. But are United even close to being the most interesting prospect out there for him? I mean, we were talking about it before, Jake, the possibilities. If Pochettino were to leave it a little bit, OK, Bayern don't have a permanent manager at the moment, but you leave it six months, by which point your legend grows. It's happened mm. to Tuchel, it's happened to Guardiola. Alan you know, Kerbishley. <laughs> exactly. What's a legend? Exactly. The by world's now. greatest manager <laughs> yeah. by, by, by that uh, token. But you look at the jobs that could be free come spring or next summer. Bayern, Juventus, Paris Saint-Germain, Real Madrid, just for starters. And that's with us saying he'll never go to Barcelona because of the Espanyol link. But, you know, you can bet there are some people in the boardroom at the Camp Nou who are going, come on, why not? So you're talking about five of the world's biggest clubs why would you want Manchester United and no prospect of there being a sporting directorship, which was half of the problem at Spurs, mm. if you could go for one of those jobs instead? I, I think he's wise to sit it out and, and see what comes up. I think Man United, for the, for the moment, have got the right manager at, at, at the helm. I think the fact that he he's, eats, sleeps, breathes Manchester United, I think is a huge positive. And I think that the poor performances have slightly been, not overshadowed, but swept under the carpet because he's a club legend. So not many fans want to jump on his back and criticise him and give him a hard time because at the end of the day, they can see what he's trying to do. He's trying to bring the young players in, which is what they want and what they've seen happen when Solskjaer was playing, obviously. And I think that I think that's bought him a little bit of time anyway. And I, I think he got him a three-year contract last year and I think he'll probably, he'll stay to the end of the season for sure. But I, I, I think Edward would, would, he's probably typed the number into his phone of Maurizio Pochettino's agent and then thought, now it's going to cost me too much money, that. What, the phone call? No, the actual, yeah. <laughs> getting the Solskjaer, <laughs> no, getting Pochettino in. No, it is probably too tight for the phone call yeah. as well. Uh, sorry, Ed Woodward. <laughs> what does that do then to playing Sheffield United or playing at Sheffield United this <clears throat> weekend? Well, I think you just look at United's away form. It's still poor. They've lost three of the last four away games in the Premier League. Yeah, they lost to West Ham. They lost at Bournemouth. They lost at Newcastle. These are not leading lights in the Premier League that they're losing to. And we keep hearing, oh, it's a setback. But overall, we're moving forward. And I'm nice to the tea lady. And I used to play for us. I, I, there's no other business time. of that mm. size that would take on a guy with his CV at all, in a, in a senior managerial position. They're muddling through. They're dressing it up because they're saying, yes, he's bringing the young players through. Yes, we're rebuilding. But this is Manchester United. And, you know, they're scrabbling around, hoping that they can get a top four finish. And you don't really see the progress that they are briefing that they're mm. making at the moment. And, and also, I, I've just fallen into the trap that everyone falls into and we, we just focused on Manchester United, which is all down to me. But Sheffield United, storming, stonking, great season so far. We talked about Poch. What about Chris Wilder? Yeah, yeah. I mean, what he's done there is absolutely incredible. And, you know, we always hear this about, well, we'll, we'll never find out how good Mourinho and Guardiola are because they'll never coach in the third tier or the fourth tier. Well, Wilder's done all of that. He's completing the set at the moment. He's doing an absolutely astonishing job. And we still underrate them. Sheffield United are 3.75 on the exchange to win this, despite um, United's poor away form, as Kevin was pointed out. Just despite the fact that in recent weeks, they've really responded, I think Sheffield United's players, to Wilder going, well, look, you can't get away with saying we played well against these big teams and get a pat on the head. They've started squeezing the results out. You looked at what happened to, to Arsenal there. Arsenal were never really in that game, even though it was just a 1-0. It 
It was a pretty comfortable 1-0 for, for Sheffield United. OK, it's hard, I think, after the international break to wonder how it's disrupted certain teams' rhythms and we'll only know once the weekend started. But I, I think Sheffield United are excellent value for this. If you look at the body of work that they've put together, unbeaten in five, chasing a third straight home win, drawn with Chelsea and Spurs, beaten Arsenal, pushed Liverpool really hard in that 1-0 defeat... If you're looking at it in a conservative way, you could look at backing home and drawing the double chance market at four to six on the sports book. If you want to be a bit bolder than that, yes. you could back Sheffield United, draw no bet, 2.63 on the exchange. And I think that's worth looking at. So I take all your points on board. <laughs> <laughs> and you make some valid points about current form. But I'll just get to it, Jake. Tell them they're wrong. Yeah, I mean, the, all the data points to this being almost the other way around that like you say Sheffield United have been playing really well they've been getting a good great number of points they're fifth in the league Manchester United haven't been too well but Sheffield United ranked 14th on XG this season which is like lower than I expected them to be I thought they'd been a little bit higher uh, based on what I've seen and Manchester United ranked fourth on XG so basically this is a top four team playing a bottom half team and we've got a huge amount of value in backing Man United to win here and you mentioned the away form there and I had a look on our expected goals table and, and toggled it to the away away matches and they actually have the second best record away from home according to expected goals so they're actually playing really well but not getting the results that they perhaps deserve which is I know it, when you watch them on the eye test it doesn't <laughs> yeah. look like it I mean, <laughs> but they're carving out chances whether it be from set pieces I mean you think the West Ham game Harry Maguire had a, a guilt edge chance matter missed one an open net on the back post that would have put them 1-1 one, one, and they would have perhaps kicked on um, even at Newcastle didn't concede too many good, ch too many chances to Newcastle. So I think we're slightly underrated Manchester United, and the, obviously the the market is heavily um, in depth into the recent results. If United fifth, Manchester United seventh, Sheffield United have already been to Tottenham. They, you know they've got a point. They've drawn at Chelsea. They've beaten Arsenal, and then I think the price on Manchester United is huge, absolutely massive, huge amount of value for me. If you're going to go that way, Marcus Rashford's worth a look in terms of uh, scoring at any time. He's 13 to 8 to score at any time mm -hmm. in this game. He scored in six of his last seven matches for club and country. Looked very good for England, I thought. And, you know, if you're going to back Jake's line of thinking, that's the way to go in terms of who's going to score for United. But I still think. I know the defending's improved. Yeah. I get that Harry Maguire has made a, a positive difference. No question about that. But if you're missing chances in every single game, which is what they're doing, that has to add up in the end, I think. But not to labour a point about how far behind you are on the uh, the bets and the battles come the end of the show, remind <laughs> you of Excuse how me. far behind you roll. are. I mean, yes, but you needed to be. At, at what stage will the XG balance tip happen then? If they are so far apart and, and it's not a true measure of the table and the table lies and every other cliche, at, at what point is the tip? Um. Christmas? Post? No, no, no. You can get some teams that go a full season overperforming. So two years ago when Manchester United finished second and they were a comfortable second in the league table, they actually ranked as the sixth best team throughout the entire season and they went a full season overperforming. And then the following season, they started terribly because they just carried on playing the same way they went and Mourinho got sacked early in the season. Yep, yep. So you can go you can go a full season sometimes overperforming or underperforming and then you see the regression happen the following season. Or, But it's very rare that it happens over a stretch of around 50 games without uh, evening itself out. So you can, in theory, throughout the rest of the season, you could see Sheffield United continue to overperform and go a full season and perhaps do a miracle finish sixth or something like that. Um, but from what I've seen, I don't think that's going to continue. And, you know, one of the big talking points going into the game is that Sheffield United have got the second best defence in the league. They've only conceded nine goals. Well, according to expected goals, they should have conceded closer to 18. So they're, they're giving up big chances mm -hmm. in matches. Um, and if they continue doing that, they're going to concede a lot more goals than what they are doing at the minute. Yeah. It'll catch up with them. Yeah, and you are doing a bit better. You are. You are. <laughs> this is football only better. I'm going to give you a minute just to talk about... Any other game? The final TV game, as we mentioned, is Villa-Newcastle. You can go there, but I know you've got an eye on Arsenal. Have you not, Kev? Uh, yes, Arsenal-Saints. Uh, rainbow time? Like the look. Yeah, let's give that yeah. as the rainbow time. Then. Yeah, <laughs> I'm glad you reminded Would me. Would you like to explain rainbow time? We haven't got time uh, for Rainbow it, so no. time no, no, is the game we think time. will be entertaining. Okay, go on, uh, over two on. and a half goals, both teams to score double, paid out in four of Arsenal's last six Premier League home games. Straight double on the sports book. Same game multi is 1.86. If you add in Pierre-Emerick, 
Emmerich or Bamiyong to score at any time. That jumps up to 2.74. He scored in four of his six Premier League games at the Emirates this season. Southampton not playing well, obviously struggling against relegation, but have scored in 13 of their last 14 games in all competitions. Either of you desperate to mention anything else from the Premier League weekend? Well, if, if we're looking at Monday, um, I think Newcastle are quite long uh, at Aston Villa. Um, 3.45 to win um, Newcastle. And Villa, are they kind of the Man United of the bottom half, really, aren't they? The fact that they've spent all that money, but you're looking at them and thinking, it's all a bit stodgy, and where are the goals coming from? Yeah. So that, that for me, is a concern. Newcastle on two successive Premier League wins. Um, there's no need to record and loop that bit because it's never going to happen again for the, for the rest of the season <laughs> after we've got past this three. Um, I, I think they're, they're looking a lot more solid, a lot more settled after the, the, the post-Rafa Blues. And uh, I think it's a good opportunity for them. I've got 1-1 that one. One thing very quickly from that game, mm. Newcastle a lot more adventurous recently in terms of committing men forward to the attack. Won 3-2 at West Ham, beat Bournemouth 2-1, have scored in four of the last five games. Villa, their last seven games in the Premier League, featured three goals or more. I'm going over two and a half goals on the exchange more rainbow at 1.96. Yeah, to back you up on that, 41% of Newcastle's total expected goals have come in the last two matches. Ooh. So prior to that, they basically haven't been creating anything. So. Wow. Steve Bruce has officially taken the handbrake off um, and Newcastle are rolling. I agree. I think Newcastle, I'd probably play it a bit safer, go Newcastle or the draw or, or Lane Aston Villa. Rainbow time, fully fully on board with that in that game. And and I know you'll disagree with me, but I, I think Everton are a good bet to win to nil against Norwich. Norwich are really struggling going forward at the minute. Don't spoil it. Don't spoil it. When we get to my battle <laughs> That's around 2.52. I'll tell you where I'm going. Just to round off then, uh, betfair.com, you can see uh, the best of the, of the weekends. More views from all of this lovely lot too. But your better the weekend from the Premier League, Kev. Uh, I'm going to go with that. Chelsea bet back then plus one and plus one and a half on the Asian handicap at Man City at 2.04. And of the Brassel? Chelsea to win at Manchester City, 7.4. You can complete that Chelsea triumvirate if you wish, Jake. Um, no, no. I, I tipped up Man City minus one at 2.2 in that game, but my Premier League bet, I'm going to, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with the XG and I'm going to go Manchester United to beat Sheffield United at 2.26. This is football only better. There's plenty in our stable, not least NFL only better, which is well worth a listen and a watch too. Just head to betfair.com. You can find us on social media. We're at Betfair too for anything that you agree, disagree with, or any comments on our get up. You're welcome. Thank you. We're off to Europe next. This is Football Only Better in the company of me, Caroline Barker. No real company there. Jake Oscarthorpe from InfoGoals, Kev Hatchard and Andy Brasso, our European experts. And this has been described as a mini Euro break where we're off to next. To stick in your back pocket from value from the weekend rather than a full on summer holiday. So where are we going first on our... You're a mini break, Kev. Let's start in Germany, shall we? Go on. A little trip to uh, Leipzig. RB Leipzig taking on uh, FC Köln. Köln, uh, Köln a mess. It's a very excitable place. It's either going super well or mm. it's going very badly. And at the moment, it's going very badly. They lost to Hoffenheim last time mm. out. So naturally, they sacked the sporting director, Armin Fey. And then the day after that, they sacked the coach, Achim Bayerlotzer. Um, they have been replaced by Horst Held, who Köln have been after for quite some time. He's gone into the sporting director role. Marcus Gisdol, who I've never really thought was that great, has gone in as coach. So I'm not totally convinced by him, to be honest. Does that, that make it difficult to find? I just think with them, they looked as though they had a decent squad going into this season, but just hasn't clicked. Um, a lot of the new signings haven't quite worked out. They've had a few injury problems. A lot of players have lost form. Anthony Modest, who's one of their best strikers, had totally fallen out with the coach, Akin Bailorza, which I think might have been one of the reasons that he parted company with I the don't club. like that. Sorry, no, I don't, an aside. I don't either. I don't either. So Köln are going to Leipzig. Leipzig in such good form at the moment. They've won their last four competitive games, 6-1. 8-0, 2-0 and 4-2. So I'm looking at backing Leipzig here, one and a half on the Asian handicap at 1.86. So if they win by two goals or more, you win as well. Shall we head to Italy? Let's. There's loads going on there this weekend, um, mostly on, on, on Saturday, uh, where you've got Atalanta versus Juventus and uh, you've got Milan versus Napoli. Now, on paper, of course, Milan versus Napoli looks the far more attractive one. But these are two clubs in a total mess at the moment. No real time, of course, to 
really sort things out during the international break. The local media in Naples are still going on about the fallout between the board and the players. Carlo Ancelotti has not managed to get all this attacking talent that he's got to click. And so even though Milan have not beaten anyone who's any good so far this season, uh, their, their, their previous home win was against Spal, who are anchored in the relegation zone and probably will be there for most of the season with um, a Suso free kick. So you, you, you can barely even call it a win, really. Um but I think they're quite interesting in this at 3.3 because they were really good last time out at Juventus. Now, of course, with the Cristiano Ronaldo substitution kerfuffle, uh, Paolo Dybala came on and scored the winning goal. With Ronaldo on the pitch, they were not going to end up beating Milan, I think. So that mm. worked out quite well for Maurizio Sarri. But it does show that there is something there for, for Milan and maybe they could take advantage of what's happening for for Napoli because um, Napoli have a huge Champions League game in the week that they're going to have one eye on as well. And it's it's funny how this could kind of be overshadowed by Atalanta versus Juventus. Atalanta have had their best ever start to a Serie A season. Um, and you look at the fact with Juventus, we're focusing so hard on the competition between them. I want to say between them and Inter. Actually, it's between them and Antonio Conte. You want to say them and um, themselves. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I think it's easy to overlook how good Atalanta have been. 3.1 to win. They're back in their home now at Bergamo. They're extremely strong there. They've got a lot of goal scoring options. Interesting. See, I actually quite like Juve for this. Uh, 2.42. They've won their last four in all competitions. What they tend to do is every time you look at them in Serie A and you think, oh, that might be quite tough for them, they win. Mm. Every time you think, oh, this will be where they slip up, they find a way. And it I makes think them play better. Better opposition does. makes yeah, them play better. Yeah, it absolutely does. It's, it's one of those scenarios. You used to find this with Bayern sometimes under Pep Guardiola that actually they they faced Dortmund or something like that and they thought, oh, at last, a game that's really, really going to push us. And I think this is the case with Juve. Atalanta as Andy says, have been great generally, but they're having a wobble at the moment. They've won just one of the last five in Serie A, just two of the last eight overall in all competitions. So I actually think Juve at 2.42 to win is a pretty good price. I agree with Andy. I think Atlanta are the bet here. I've th <clears throat> not been sold on what Sarri's been doing at Juve. They've not really impressed me. Um, they seem to make hard work of games that they shouldn't be making hard work of. I think that's just him tinkering with the system and, and trying to get his, his best 11 on the pitch. Um, as for Atlanta, you know exactly how they're going to line up. You know exactly the style of football they're going to play. They are the best attacking team in Serie A according to expected goals. I think they'll create good chances and score goals against Juve. And I think 3.15 is, is, is a really big price. And the Infocom model actually thinks that they should be favourites to win the game, which represents good value. Oh, so me looking at loads of goals for Juventus is, is going nowhere near that. I'd have a stinker. Where else do you want to look at this weekend? I think there's a really interesting game in La Liga because Atletico Madrid are going to Granada. Granada have been overperforming all season long. They've had a, a, a tricky time recently with three straight losses, but they've had tough games in those. They've won four of the last five at home in La Liga. They've kept clean sheets in all of those wins. If you look at Atletico, Diego Costa's been ruled out for the next couple of months at least. They haven't won any of their last four away games in all competitions. They've only won two out of six away in La Liga. I think Atleti are too short here at 1.95, so I'd be looking to lay them. You're muttering. What are you muttering for? There was a look then. <laughs> he does. No, I th I it's just I, the back of your head, I think, it's, I think it's quite right. I, I know where Jake's going to go with this, about how strong Atletico are in, in terms of XG. And I am kind of in the same boat because I think it will get better for them at some point. But you think six draws out of 13 games already yeah. and now losing Costa, even if it's only to beat up defenders while Alvaro Morata does his stuff, they're so reliant on Morata and they will continue to be. Enrique Cerezo, the president, has said, well, we haven't really got any money without selling anyone to buy someone. You have spent a fortune in the last couple of years, most of which is tied up in Diego Costa, who's going nowhere for the moment, who's not playing for anyone for the moment, and who they could have sold to the Chinese Super League a couple of months ago. So they're a little bit stuck. And yeah, it all rests on Morata. Yeah, I alluded to it there, Andy, but I, I think Atletico are a really good bet in this one. They rank as the best team in the league on expected goals, which is something that we haven't seen from them over the last two, three years under Simeone. They've always ranked sixth or seventh and managed to finish second or third, have always overperformed. And it makes a nice change for them to actually be performing well on expected goals and you know being quite high and, and challenging for honours. 
the striker issue is huge. Obviously, Costa isn't playing. I think Jao Felix is, is also a doubt, which obviously limits them. They've got Angel Correa who could come in and, and potentially um, at, give them a little bit more. But I just I look at the, the, the game and it's a sort of game you'd expect Atletico to win like a 1-0, an mm. ugly 1-0. Granada don't create a lot of chances. They, you know, they, like you mentioned, they had a hot start. They were right amongst there. They were actually top of the table at one point. Slowly falling away when they've started playing against better teams. Um, like you said, they lost the last three matches and they've all been against teams that are perhaps a tier below Atletico Madrid. But They're still kind of regressing the to the mean, aren't Absolutely, they? Absolutely, yeah. Um, they're falling back to where we'd expect them to be, which is maybe mid-table, bottom half of the table, whereas Atletico are performing like a team that can challenge for the title. And um, using expected goals and probabilities, we actually think Atletico should be priced at 1.79. So the 1.95 you are getting on the exchange actually represents a good bit of value. Regressing to the mean shall be the title of this podcast. <laughs> Before we head into our battles, just briefly, your key bet then from Europe this weekend, Kev. Uh, I think I'd be going with that Leipzig bet against Köln. Uh, I think Leipzig in such good form at the moment. So Leipzig one and a half uh, on the Asian handicap, minus one and a half against Köln at 1.86. Jakey? <laughs> You've never been a Jakey, have you? Sorry, That's Jake. twice now. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going my best bet, Athletic Madrid to beat Granada at 1.95. I'm going to have to go with Milan. It's going to be a bad weekend for Carletto. 3.3 Milan to win against Napoli. I love what you were saying about Costa. I've got a similar feeling towards Mitrovic for Fulham against QPR this weekend. Will it appear in my battle? We'll find out next on Football Only Better. I am going for Everton and both teams to score. I've just spoilt it. There's no working out there. That's where my money's going this weekend. But interestingly, because we've gone Spurs, Spurs, Spurs and everything else, Beyond. We didn't really talk about Euro 2020, which England <laughs> oh, what a thug. Are favourites? <laughs> they are. Uh, why? Remarkably. I, I couldn't tell you why they're favourites. I mean, they're six on the exchange to win Euro 2020. I know they will have home games, obviously. I'm sure that's a factor. Uh, but I, I think that even though they've beaten up some weak opposition in their group, I still think there are defensive issues there for them. You look at the way that they collapsed against the Netherlands in the Nations League. That was of huge concern, some of the goals that they gave away. And I just think that there are better bets there. You look at Belgium, who won mm. all of their qualifiers. They're 7.8 to win Euro 2020 on the exchange. Uh, France, uh, the world champions, 6.2. But the ones that really stand out for me in terms of being far too big a price at the moment are Portugal yeah. because they're trading at 15 on the exchange. They're the defending champions. They won the Nations League. I know people will say, well, how much does that matter? But, you know, they had some fairly high pressure games and won them both. And I just think that is definitely one to trade because get on that now. And as the tournament progresses, that will get shorter and shorter and shorter. People, people will say... Uh, people right about Portugal? Um, yeah, I think they could be because uh, they're significantly better than they were at the 2018 World Cup. But if we go all the way back to 2016, or we'll compare Portugal now to Portugal then, they knew how to win a tournament and they do know how to win a tournament under Fernando Santos, not just because they've been there, but because of his credo, his philosophy. Mm. And he talks about it again and again and again. He's I don't care even slightly about the kind of football we're going to play. The sort of football I want is winning football. Mm. I want to win. And he makes no apology for aesthetics or anything like that. And I think especially when you look at the issues with England defensively, um, you look at Spain, who no one's really quite sure what they are, where they are. Another coaching change for them. And Luis Enrique has got relatively little time to work to bring that extra bit of pragmatism back to them. If we're talking about defensive issues, Germany are top of the pile. Um, I, th I think unless you're going to back France, and we, what I think is a fairly generous price, as, as Kevin was saying, I would just stay well away from most of the big host nations. Netherlands, Germany, Spain, even England. It's a, it's a 12 city tour. Uh, host nation. If tourists, you want me to keep so, going, yeah. I thought going. we were pressed for time. No, go on, go on. Uh, name some more. Maybe, maybe it's just what happens to me. I mean, I said thug, maybe, but maybe it does bring out my kind of overly confident side. This this England team, but we're going to score more goals than you, and that's all that matters, right, Jake? Um, I don't think we are. No, oh. uh, the way the defence. Here's me thinking you go XG all over this. No, I, I just I look at it. I think you, you mentioned there that perhaps back in um, Portugal and perhaps laying them back, I'd probably go the other way with England. I'd probably lay them at this price and then maybe back them because I think we're going to have games against better opposition where we get beat in the build-up to the mm. competition and our price might drift and then back, back us at a bigger price potentially but still 
Um, I think there's so much better uh, better bets in there. I think France are really going to be really strong. They've they've gone through most of the qualifying campaign or the last four matches anyway without Pogba, without Kante, um, and everyone points to the fact that they made games like Albania look a struggle, but. That's France. They made they, throughout the entire World Cup. They made games look 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 tough. Um, but that's they, similar to Portugal. They play winning football. They they've got great individuals. They've got a solid system. Everyone knows their job. They're really hard to beat, and they've got that bit of star quality, mm-hmm. um, which is why I probably I'd personally make them favourites to win the Euros. And then I think Portugal are a great bet as well at fifteen. A lively outsider. I've been impressed with Ukraine. They're in their nineties. They they could perhaps do something. Uh, maybe worth some each way money there. I mean. I don't know if there wasn't even a flicker of emotion across your face when he said. Oh, there was a nod. No, I think it's a decent yeah. shout. No, I think they're handy. ninety on the exchange. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Shevchenko's managed to get them playing consistent football. They were ever so good in the home game against Portugal yeah, they were. in the qualifiers. Played really well, one-two-one. Um, and, and there aren't many teams that give Portugal that many problems in defence. So, if they could click in the same way, I think as a price to trade, mm. 90 is pretty good. Okay. Uh, and I'll just clarify by thug, I mean tough, which in my house means that you don't get extra cream on top of your scone when you're watching England. That's exactly how it happens. Quickly then, your battle bets. I've said Everton to win, both teams to score. That's where I'm going. Where are you going, Jake? Uh, I'm actually going Germany this week. Yeah, I, I think... Brunch, sorry, the leaders of the Bundesliga, Borussia Mönchengladbach, they are uh, about even money, 2.02, I think, on the exchange to go to Union Berlin and get a win. So? So I'm going for Borussia Mönchengladbach to win. Uh, they're flying at the top of the table. Um, according to our big chance metric, which is anyone who has a chance of 35% or greater being scored, that they, they've created the most big chances in the in the Bundesliga by a, a long way ahead of Bayern Munich. And Union Berlin, they've, they've had a couple of good results recently, but they've, they've been fortunate ones according to expected goals. And I think... Munch and Gladbach are going to have way too much for them. And I, I think that's a really good price. Good value. Okay. Uh, I was tempted by that one, but I've uh, gone elsewhere in Germany. Borussia Dortmund at home to Paderborn on Friday night. Uh, Paderborn bottom, deservedly so. They are short of the level required to compete at that level. And it's one of those things where not only don't they have the quality to compete, they're not even doing the defensive basics. So they lost 3-0 at Hoffenheim, they lost 3-0 at Köln. That takes some doing. They were beaten 5-1 at home by Schalke. And I just think Dortmund, wounded by how pitiful they were in De Classica against Bayern last time out, will be angry. And they are minus two and a half on the Asian handicap at 2.2. So if they win by three goals or more, you get an odds against winner. Andy, briefly. I know. I reckon Hoffenheim have had enough of Kev. They'll be, <laughs> oh, we're getting a slipper off Mr. Hatchard again. again. It's Thursday. Um, I'm going to be loyal to Serie A. I'm going to go for Verona to beat Fiorentina, 3.35. Uh, Verona have, have been really terrific since they've come up. Young team led by Miguel Veloso, who's kind of having a second wind for them as, as captain in, in midfield. Um, they're good to watch as well. And uh, Fiorentina have really fallen off in recent weeks. I just wonder if this is Montel hitting the Montella wall and it doesn't look as if Frank Ribery is going to be fit to play either okay betfair.com you can find out the latest from this lovely lot and plenty more besides remember to gamble responsibly we'll be back this time next week enjoy us and if you have then do give us a rating via your normal podcast provider remind you can watch us too on Twitter and on YouTube but from all of us bye for now 